Welcome. Thank you for joining us for worship at this occasion. We're most happy to have you. This is the day that the Lord has made. In fact, it's the first day of the rest of the year that the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and we shall be glad in it. In spite of what comes our way, we are definitely going to be successful at greeting every single moment with the Spirit of God going for us and being with us. On this occasion, we are wishing to thank you for your prayers, your gifts, your offerings, your support, your presence. We couldn't do this without you. Again, welcome. Our first reading is actually coming from Psalms 139 and verses 1 through 4, the New Revised Standard Version. And it is recorded, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, oh Lord, you know it completely. Fantastic. We're talking about an amazing God. We need not fret or worry. Because he does the threatening and worrying for us. He says, cast all your cares upon me and I care for you. And that's a good deal. It's an excellent deal. Anyone who is not accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and God the Father is the gift of salvation and the giver of life. If we're somehow just ignoring that, and putting it aside and postponing it, it's not a wise decision. Because there's a guarantee, 100% plus guarantee in a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And the message today, we're dealing with accountability to, accountability to, to with question marks. Who are we accountable to? And I just wanted to say, after reading 139 of the Psalm, uh, the Psalm teaches us that God knows all about us. And he is the inescapable God. And he has exact and perfect knowledge of mankind. None of us escape his knowledge of us. We simply cannot hide. There is not a place dark enough, far enough, high enough, deep enough. Absolutely. To keep God away from us and from knowing what we're up to. I encourage everyone to read Psalms 139. Just Lock out some time in your busy schedule. Grab the book. B-I-B-L-E and the author is eternal God himself. And read Psalms 139. It has a wealth of, of, of material that will paint a masterpiece before your mind and before your heart as you read it. It is just a blessing. God knows all about David, and, and as this particular song defines. In fact, the, the central theme is, is based on his knowledge of King David. And it was David who was just a shepherd boy, assigned to sheep in the wilderness, unsupervised. And who would have thought that our God would have taken someone from such a, a menial, menial position in society and raised him up to be king. David's position behind the scene as a young boy was merely to get the sheep from pasture to pasture safely. That was his assignment. And on a couple of occasions, he had the opportunity to show his real commitment from the heart. And that's when he took on a lion and a bear on separate occasions. And he was victorious in destroying them for the safety of the sheep. And God saw something in that heart of David who would give such attention and consideration and regards for the commitment that he took and being accountable and responsible to his father who gave him the assignment that he was being groomed all along among sheep to be a king of God's people. I tell you, accountability is very important. In the first part of Psalms, 
We learn that God knows David's thoughts and his ways. God knows when he sits down and when he rises up. God knows his thoughts or his intentions. God knows his paths, the places he would travel or long to travel. God is acquainted with all his ways, whether he's kind or gentle or thoughtful or considerate or accountable and responsible. That's what we're talking about. And David definitely was a responsible young man to govern sheep. And he was accountable to his father. If he left with 50 sheep, he came back with 50 sheep. If he said he was going to the east, he went to the east. We learned that even before a word is on his tongue, God knows it all together. He knows the, the mental concept of beginning to think and reason to speak. This God is an awesome God. The same way this applies to David, it applies to us. We're not exempt from God knowing our thoughts. And sometimes we have some pretty bad thoughts. And of course, someone's saying, yes, I can't control my thoughts. <clears throat> well, let's put it this way. When something comes to you that's ungodly, unpleasant, totally evil, wicked, perverted, you must resist it. The word of God says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do you resist it? You can do what Jesus did in the wilderness. He used the word of God. You can sing a song using the lyrics that pertain to the word of God. You can whisper the word of God, yell the word of God, sing the word of God, write the word. Whatever you do, resist the devil and he will flee. Don't allow yourself to be entertained mentally or spiritually with ungodly things and godly concepts and thoughts. Turn them away or you turn away from them. I am so grateful that the prophet Jeremiah once said, can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? Jeremiah speaking on behalf of God. And do I not feel heaven and earth? God says, I put everything there for state. I know where everything's placed. Now look, we're all famous. And I'll confess, losing keys and misplacing my cell phone. I'm sure at least two times a day, one of the two is my question. Where are my keys? Where's my cell phone? But you know, God knows all the time where every little thing is, even as we misplace them. Isn't that amazing? And then we know he knows the thoughts that we have as it pertains to those things. Whether we're becoming angry or if we have a disrespect for thoughts, are we blaming people in our thoughts? Had they not asked me to do ABC, I would now be looking for my keys. If they hadn't borrowed my phone, I would still have it in my person and I don't know what I've done. With. Do we start charging other people? Jesus said <clears throat> this about knowledge of each of us. He actually knows the hairs that are on our head. He says the hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, who would care? Who would really care to know? Only God. He cares that much about us to know how many numbers of hairs are on our head. We don't even know this, but God knows this about each of us. He designed us in our mother's womb. And he programmed us. And when we come to ourselves and we come to know God through his son, Jesus Christ, and we accept him as our savior, and that means we're willing to make transition and to change and all those things about us that are minuses and negatives, we want to get rid of. We desire to get rid of. We insist on getting away from and embracing ourselves with the positive, the godly things, the godly characteristics, godly habits. And we become more godlike. Christ like is our mission. The author of Hebrews says, No 
secret creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. We're talking about accountability. Hebrews 4.13 tells us that no creature, no human being is hidden from God's sight. In the eyes of God, we're all naked and exposed. He sees all the little details. And it's to him that we'll give an account. He's given us life, health, and strength. That's an awful lot. Extremely valuable. Speaking of valuable, well, most people may have a life insurance and they'll get one chunk of that, which it does not equate to the life. It's just a sum of funds to help the family to carry on. But it doesn't equate to the life, the personality, the love, the relationship, the bond. We are valuable. We are valuable to God. We are talking about accountability. And so since we are valuable to God and he's given us life, health, and strength. And you do the math. How much are you worth? How much do you think you're worth? Well, certainly... For life, health, and strength alone, we must be accountable for that. That energy, that life, that the knowledge we obtain, the opportunities that we're given, we have to be responsible. We have to answer to God for how we use and how we utilize and, and how we interact with this gift he's given us called life. God knows all our movements, our going and our coming. Whether we're, we're, whether we're lazy or, 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 or we just do enough to get by, he knows. He knows. God knows our thoughts and our intentions. Whether we are pessimist and, and negative or whether we are optimistic and positive, he knows. He knows whether we whine and complain and gripe. He knows. God knows our words before we speak them. So maybe we might want to consider thinking before we speak. So good practice, a good habit to form. Think before you speak. If what you have to say is not a blessing, shh, it's not needed. God can see and he knows anywhere we might be. There's no dark place. He's there. We take him wherever we go. Is it a place we want to be seen? If the paparazzi were to show up, are we okay with pictures being taken? In some of the places we allow ourselves to go with the life, health, and strength that he's given us. God has seen and known us from beginning to end. He knows our arrival and he knows our departure. He knows. God knows all about us. God knows all about you and about me. Nobody comes and goes on this planet without him knowing. This is an awesome God. We're talking about accountability. And since he's making provision for us and we can't get away from us, it would just behoove us to be accountable and responsible, number one, to God. And number two, to our fellow man. And how we utilize our life in glorifying God and blessing others. God is amazing. God can do anything with all of us and through us. If we will but submit ourselves, what a wonderful world it would be. I am just excited to say that God is beyond us, way beyond us. We simply don't have the capacity to, to grasp and understand what God can do. We serve a mighty great God. He's worthy of the praise. From sun up to sundown, he's worthy of the praise. If you're doing evil, if you're doing wrong and ungodly things, this should cause you some concern. That's because you can't evade God. You can't keep God in the dark. If you're doing evil, thinking evil, plotting evil, 
it's time for self-evaluation because you will and are accountable. You're accountable to God and how you utilize the life and all the accessories that he provides for your comfort and the comfort of those you care for. And then you are also accountable and responsible for others, your neighbor. He's commanded us to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. And then likewise to love your neighbor as yourself. And if by chance there's a deep-rooted hatred or if you're inclined to racism that might have been embedded from childhood or from observation of those around you, just get a grip. Pull yourself aside and take a look at your heart. The heart that's pumping. Blood to all the extents of your body internally. It's operating as a factory, doing what God has designed to do to keep you and keep me and keep us alive. And can you just settle down and, and really look at self and ask self, am I justified in my thinking to determine that I'm better than someone else? that I can make a judgment call on life or death without any kind of remorse and consideration. We need to really ask ourselves, check ourselves. I mean, did you make your ears, your eyes, your nose? Of course not. Totally incapable. And since God strategically knitted us together, fingers to nails and hand to wrist. And he's done such an excellent job with this thing. So much so that we don't want to be hurt or injured. So we shouldn't want to hurt and injure anyone else. And we enjoy living. And we all have the expiration date. But we want God to make that call. We don't want it to be on us because we have to be accountable. Do you believe that there is an age when you are old enough to say just whatever you want to about whoever or whatever because you have lived long enough to do this? Do you really think so? I've seen lots of, 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 of well-aged people taking advantage of their age to say a lot of things that are not so kind, that are not so nice, that are not so helpful. And they feel I'm old enough to say this and I need to say everything I need to say before I check out. Well, then whatever we have to say, whether we're young, middle-aged or older, if it's not to be a blessing and to glorify, a blessing to our fellow man, to glorify God, we don't have to hear it. And it doesn't have to be said. Trust takes years to build. It takes seconds to break and forever to repay. So consider that. If someone has trusted you with something, a secret, an experience that they shared with you in confidence, if they trust you to be their neighbor and you betray them, please consider the fact that it takes years to build trust. You, 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 you even... In raising our children, we're teaching them right from wrong, and we're trying to mold them into the position where they can be trusted, and so they can see the value of accountability and responsibility to their fellow man, to their siblings, to their mother and father. You learn that at home, and then it spreads apart as you go to school. Then you learn the responsibility of your obligation to fulfill the assignment of your teacher, the obligation to your friends if if, the, if you're borrowing a book or or if you need a pencil, whatever it might be, you've got to be accountable and responsible. We're not to mistreat others. You cannot be accountable to God without being accountable to God's people. That's his measuring tool for us. How we treat others is how he measures us. That's how he weighs the scale. That's how he grades us. For us to say, oh, Lord, I love you with all my heart. And you don't speak to your neighbor. You see your neighbor in need. You don't assist. 
you see someone needing counseling and you 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 refuse to speak you see someone is needing transportation you refuse to give them a ride and it's and it's an easy thing for you to do ah think about it james 1 5 reminds us that sin when it grows when it's grown up it leads to death sin when it is grown as, as, as it matures it leads to death it becomes more entrenched and, and, and more attached to what it's been it expands and then he goes on in the fourth chapter said those who know to do good and do not do it you're accountable we're accountable Matthew tells us it's our responsibility. We have a responsibility to God and to our fellow man. You don't have to like them particularly for whatever your reason might be. Maybe they're a little noisy. Maybe they're a little not too tidy. But nevertheless, they belong to God. Now let's just look at Mark, what Mark has to say in Mark 2, uh, verses 3 through 12. I'm just going to read a portion of that, but it is recorded in the New Revised Standard Version. And then some people came bringing to him, man, Jesus, a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And at once Jesus perceived, mind you, in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now, this is a story that's in Mark, second chapter, verses 3 through 12. And it's self-explanatory. Basically, Jesus is in a dwelling place, a building of sorts, and he's ministering to the people. And there are four men who have a friend who's paralyzed. Doesn't give the explanation as to how he came about being paralyzed, but he was paralyzed. And they had him on a mat. And the four men could not get their friend into Jesus for the healing experience. And they had, I presume, journeyed the distance that many of the others had journeyed. But they wanted their friend to receive a healing. How do we know they wanted that? Because they climbed on to the top of the building and they removed a portion of the roof so that they could let their paralyzed friend in. Now, that is what you call accountability. These four men felt that they were obligated to bring somebody to Jesus who couldn't bring themselves. Do you hear what I'm talking about? There were four friends who were insistent, determined to bring a friend to them who was paralyzed. He could not take himself. And when Jesus, the scripture says, when Jesus perceived in his spirit when he saw their faith, I, we're talking earlier that God sees everything. And God and his son, Jesus Christ, are the same. They're one of the same. So they see they have the same gifts. They have the same abilities. So Jesus also sees. He sees the gift of faith in these four men. It's not something tangible that you can touch. He sees it from the spirit realm. And he sees these four men are responsible and accountable to their friend. And they wanted him to be delivered through the power and the gift of healing that Jesus possessed. 
And Jesus didn't look at the faith of the paralytic. Jesus looked at the faith of the four friends. And based on their insistent faith, their friend was healed. And sins were forgiven. Now, when they said sins were forgiven, I'm not so sure if the, the, the man who was paralyzed might have caused some problems and was involved in an accident as a result. I'm not sure what the story is, and that's not even the important part of it. The important part is that somebody cared enough to bring somebody to Jesus who couldn't, who was just in lockdown, basically, paralyzed, couldn't move himself, could, couldn't care for himself, couldn't, couldn't get free, couldn't walk, couldn't run, couldn't make a decision for himself. Somebody cared enough. And one of Jesus is doing this great work, he perceives in the midst of his working, of performing a miracle, he perceives that there are those among him who are trying to define him as breaking a Jewish law of blasphemy. So who does he think he is? No one can forgive sins but God. <laughs> well, Jesus already said, if you see me, you see my father. Ding. But sometimes we just don't get it. And so Jesus just stopped in the midst of his operation to let these guys know, I know what you're thinking. And you're totally off base. And I'll prove to you, not only do I forgive sins, <laughs> I do that which is needed to be done. He says, your sins are forgiven. He says, which is the best to say? What do I have to do to prove to you who I am? You see the, those that have gained their sight. You see those who were limping, those who were deaf, those who were mute, who've been delivered. I mean, what part of this are you not getting? Well, but do so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says, I'm going to show you. I'm the son of man. I'm the son of God as well. And he said to the paralytic, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And this man didn't stand up, showing off, being arrogant. Oh, look, I, I can walk. Oh, I'm going to go to the next party. Go, go see my friends. But no, no, no. He was so grateful and astounded and amazed himself. He did exactly what he was told. He stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them. The house was filled with people waiting to be ministered by Jesus. And so they were amazed when they saw him. And the bottom line is that they glorify God. This whole thing is all about glorifying God, being accountable to God. God wants us to rejoice when those who are lost come to him and our job those of us who know the way uh, to show the way lead the way embrace the way and glorify god and they said we've never seen anything like this and truly they had not but even in this 21st century there are still encounters where god does some miraculous encounters and even though we're virtually now operating in many churches, God is still God. I've, I said at the beginning of the year, it's a new year, a new norm, but the same God. Please, if you will, consider. Consider being accountable. To who? To God and to our fellow man. Accountability to who? To God and to our fellow man. Would you be urgent, as urgent as these four men were to bring their paralytic friend to Jesus and to get the mission accomplished if it means going out of their way, finding ladders, saws, and whatever is necessary, and putting their work and effort into it, then to pick the, the brother up and then to lower him down into the house in their midst. Oh, that's love. That's commitment. That's accountability. 
That's responsibility. That's being responsible. We know it's natural for man to want to do things his way. He thinks he's at Burger King in most instances, and he's just driving through, and I want this and that, and I want it this way. But when it comes to the things of God, it's God's way. Here we are in the midst of a situation at church is what's going on. A healing service is in progress, and Jesus is there. And we find that, that he, he is built in love while there are others sitting there that are built in legalism. He, he is presenting God's holy law that I can do. I can forgive sins. And there are the law givers building on tradition. We've never done it this way. We haven't had it done this way. We don't want it done this way. Then we find Jesus operating in freedom, but we find others who are operating in bondage. Let things stay like they are, and he's not supposed to do this, and we don't want this healing going on. We find that Jesus is stressing and expressing the inner attitude of his heart, love, and compassion. Yet we find others are sitting in his midst that would rather see the young man remain paralyzed than to be healed. How awful. How cruel. That's an evil thing. Not to want to see a sick man walk again. Not to see the blind. Not wanting to see the blind to see again. Or the mute to speak. That's evil. God wouldn't have us to do that. The story of Jesus healing the paralytic man raises the question of what, what we would have done. Just look at the energy and the love and compassion that's placed into placing their, their friend in the midst of Jesus. There's no better place you can take a friend. There's no greater assignment that you can perform than to bring a soul that can't bring itself to Jesus. May we be accountable to God and to our fellow man. Hope to see you again real soon. To God be the glory for the things that he has done and the things that he's doing and the things he's going to do. I love you to life. Take care.